Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite bands, Alice in Chains. Alice in Chains was formed in 1987, I believe. The first thing you should note is, get the new singer in the picture of the band off the wiki and put Lane Stanley in there, please. I know this would be an argument, but anyway... It was formed in 1987 by the guitarist Jerry Cantrell and the former drummer. Eventually, going into Lane Stanley and my favorite era of the band. Now, I've done Kiss and I've done Queensryche, and they are, like this will be, more of what the band meant to me, not more of a history of the band and all the ins and outs. Really, it's a, you know, it's a playlist that'll capture some of my favorite bands and music and how they impacted me and where kiss was something i grew up on and it was just there and i loved it rolling stones i haven't done one of those but what do you say about arguably the best band ever queen's reich was a band i felt i found i described that in my um podcast on it when you're at a kiss concert and queen's reich opens up and you hear Warning, and you hear their album music and his voice. I was captivated. And there aren't that many times in life where you find those um, moments, and Alice in Chains is one of them. Um, There are moments where, you know, you're, you're in a club or you're at a concert and something surprises you and wows you. Alice in Chains is definitely one of those bands. And because they get lumped in with the grunge movement, bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, which is fine, excellent, amazing bands, I don't like when they kind of lump Lane Stanley in with those singers. So, for instance, Kurt Cobain and Eddie Vedder are nothing compared to uh, Lane Stanley, in my opinion. Now, Chris Cornell of Soundgarden, definitely. You know, the range, the power, the whole thing. Although I love the bands, love the music, listen to the albums. It's just fabulous stuff. When I'm talking about a quality singer and what they bring to the table, as I discussed with Queensryche, Jeff Tate might be the best ever, in my opinion. And obviously, because it fits the genre I love, you love the music and you love the albums, of course it's going to help. Someone's going to be able to pick out a a certain singer who can hit a better range, or so on and so forth. But Alice in Chains Like Queensryche was part of my music therapy, was part of going through life and using music and learning how to meditate and focus on things, on music that really disabled me. It destroys you. It, um, it, It envelops you and just takes it takes you where it wants you to take you and it's subliminal it's subconscious yes you know you tie certain songs into moments of your life and i try to unravel that knot and make it my own again so where i discuss with queens like they're a band that's more upbeat positive a little mysterious and love songs here and there and alice in chains is the dark gritty pain the, the struggle the depression the addiction it's all there in that music, and I use them to, mostly in a way, and there's other bands like Pantera, and so on and so forth, but the bands that really mean something to you where, you know, we can debate how great Alice in Chains was, and you have a better band, or even if you like rap music, house music, which fucking drives me nuts, and I'm not a fan, we all get something from it, and I think that's a beautiful thing about music. And even in studies and science, finding out that things like Alzheimer's and dementia can affect the music and things you associate with it, so they're doing new therapies. Just an amazing gift to humanity. And I use this Alice in Chains music and to get through these things, and I lock myself up with some of the songs, so... There's a song uh, I described on my Queen track I couldn't listen to until I did my own. I worked through things. Uh, the, the Lady Wore Black and for Alice in Chains, it's Love, Hate, Love, um, Junkhead, and things like that. And you get 
I get, look, this is not everybody's not the same, obviously, but it kind of like, if I listen to that song again, it puts me in that mood and it really is not good for me at certain parts of my life. So I don't have to go into everything here, but there's moments in everybody's life and in particularly mine where um, there's tragedy in a sense and look, I'm not worse than any other person, or but things affect me in a certain way. And, you know, I faced a dark, deep depression, um, one I didn't know if I was going to recover from. Um, even now, I'm always describing it like cobwebs, not like, uh, you know, where people describe it as a blanket thrown over you. It's more like cobwebs that are always there, and you feel them sticking to you in, in that sense. But anyway, getting back to Alice in Chains, a deep, guttural, visceral raw emotions embedded into every lyric all the music in the lane stanley stanley era so let's say up to 96 i think it's lane staley i don't know i'm sorry and it's so important to me like you i'm a i play guitar i don't know if i call myself a guitarist <laughs> you know i play guitar and when i was younger i have it it's in my room i haven't played it in a while that's another issue or struggle, uh, goal I'm trying to reach. And here we have Alice in Chains again. And going through life, it meant a lot to me. You know, you feel like you found the band. Uh, you know, it captures a moment in your life and what you're going through. And I happen to, as I said, bind myself up with some of the tragedy, turmoil with what was going on. And recently, I had started getting better and getting through my things and now I can listen to music and I make it what I want it to be. I don't have to be a slave to the emotions and the thoughts that come with the songs. And it's part of my whole thing. The foundation for wellness, I believe in breathing and meditation exercises are the foundation for a better life. Something I wish we could teach the kids and so on. And looking at the albums that Alan's Chains put out, it kind of, you know, when we go through life, we look at these things and, oh, this was the first album, this is what I was doing. And in particular, I'm actually, uh, believe it or not, I had a friend, we played D&D &D all the time, Larry, and um, we used to go to Walden's Books, and there was another bookstore in the, uh, in the mall, King's Plaza, in Brooklyn, New York, and we would get books and go back and smoke a little weed and read them, and he would pick a different sort of genre, so for instance, if people know what I'm talking about, it's the Forgotten Realms, he picked out the Forgotten Realms books, and I picked out the Dragonlance books, and at the time, they were settling in, getting their role-playing game going with AD&D, so they had their own worlds and so on, and, and as I'm reading this book, uh, oh man, I wish I knew which one it was. It was the one where the dragon's coming out of the well, and Riverwind and Goldmoon are there. I think Riverwind gets blasted with acid and dies and whatever. But as it's coming out of the well, We Die Young comes on, and it starts with a heavy groove and it's scaries on the wall. Scaries, he's on his way. And I will forever, I get goosebumps thinking about it. Such a cherished moment. Uh, you know, listening to a new band, me and my friend, new music. We got, we go out and we get books and we read them, novels. It's, you know, something I might even write in a script. And, so impactful it reminds me of getting motley crew shout out to devil um which i won't compare to bands because i'm gonna be honest motley crew to me is bad live and i'll, I'll get into that a little bit too for what, what reason why i think and why alice in chains is unique so alice in chains doesn't have two guitars now maybe they've done things where there's more guitars there and there's orchestras and stuff but when you have a band and you have only one guitarist, now I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I did say I play guitar, and if you don't write your music a certain way, if you don't apply it to your studio albums, people will notice immediately when you're live. 
So if you're going to play a melody and a lead and you put it on your album, you want it to be, in my opinion, like it would sound live. So you would have a bass groove and the drum groove behind. Once you start adding layers of other guitars and such, when you go live, it, it drops out. The whole sound drops out. It just doesn't feel right. Now, this might be just a me thing. Maybe people don't catch it. But I have enough musician friends that I think it's an agreeable thing. You make the music in a certain way. And when you put it on the studio album, it comes in. That's why when I listen to Motley Crue, when I've seen them, it's um, not really a fun experience for me. Or the one time I saw them or the three times I've watched their live stuff, you know. And just like I did with Allison Chains, you go for deep dives to find really good content. You got to thank YouTube. Uh, you know, a lot of times you shit on them. It took me a while, but I've got excellent versions of Love, Hate, Love, Man in the Box, Junkhead. Um, it ain't like that anymore. Oh, some great stuff. And this is, uh, you know, impactful in a way. And like I try to describe and how it affects me going through these albums, uh, you know, with the first one is Facelift and the EP they did, Dirt, um, Jar of Flies, Sap. These are the things that impact me. And when Allison Chains puts these albums up, for the most part, they put them in a way live where they sound amazing. If they do change things up, it seems to be for the better. And that's a big thing for me. Maybe it shouldn't be. I don't know. But if I want to go to a... Um, if you're attached to a band, you really love them. And I guess that matters because, like I keep describing, they're important to me as a band. The music, what it means to me, the weight of it, the struggle, the whole behind the scenes stuff. When you hear them live, you want to hear that album and... Yes, it does matter when the performance has changed. I think Bon Jovi's notorious for that. Like, they did a concert or did a tour where they changed everything. It was horrible. But Allison Chains has a knack for that. For doing something on the album you don't think is going to sound, or, th or you know can't be done live, and they do something to match it up and mix it up, and it sounds great. So in that case, it's talent and... You know, maybe luck when you look into the things on how they got together and different bandmates and, you know, they, he was a drummer or, you know, some of the stories and they were hiring um, shitty singers to, uh, to interview for the band and until they got him to sing because he was good. And the name Allison Chains, it was Alice and Chains at one point because they didn't think about uh, you know, the Bonjies thing. But you do have a troubled band, and the, you know, there's that debate also of how do you um, idolize somebody who let drugs destroy him, and you know, you just talk about it and you try to be truthful. I try to separate my feelings of you know the love I have for his music, what he's done, and where you go wrong in these things. Think about it this way. Let's give. All the points, let's say you're handsome, beautiful, whatever, rich, famous. There's really not much you need to struggle with in those things. And even then, you succumb to drug addictions and know you're going to die and die anyway. Looking into it even further, when you look at the formation, how the bands knew each other, you got Chris Cornell after Kurt Cobain died, after Lane Staley died, band members he knew, and they all kind of knew each other in that way. Even he passed away and a suicide. It's sad, and it's... um. You know, something I think we need to talk about and work through. This is not an easy fix. But there's also things to ground yourself in and not be fooled by. Like little deepities that, you know, money will buy you a certain amount of happiness. There is no doubt. 
but where that ends, there's actually um, studies done on this, like a certain amount of money after that, it doesn't matter. What, what happens next? It's your genetics, it's your environment. I often struggle with my truth over feelings thing when I would rather have a friend mad at me, never speak to me, but be alive. And I think that's some of the regrets people have. Like, you know, he was not found until eight days after he uh, had an overdose. Lane Staley in his apartment. No one talked to him. He was a fucking video game freak, apparently. There's tons of documentaries. You can go and do a deep dive if you want. But strictly from a music point of view, Allison changed from, you know, 87, 90 to 96. It's one of the best bands, in my opinion, ever. And there's a power and emotion that he can bring forth in his lyrics. I'll quickly talk about the new version of Alice in Change, which I've heard some stuff, and the singer seems very capable. But my advice would be this. It'd be twofold, I guess. One, if you're gonna do co- if you're gonna do the stuff that the other guy did, try to sound like him. And I know it might be cliche, or it might uh, try to imitate that vocal style. Don't try to make it your own. Now, when you make new stuff, that's when you put your twist and your own uniqueness on it. Now, that's just my opinion. And I think he's done that because I've watched enough of the videos recently that the new singer would put his own inflections on certain things. And we've heard these songs before over and over. This happened with Queen's Rike also. And then in other concerts or more recent concerts, you know, in timeline of things, he changes it to sound more like Lane Staley, what he sounded like. And I think that's admirable. I think that's smart. And when you make your new songs, that's when you put your twist on it. The second thing is, I don't know what the fuck Allison Change is doing now, but when I see them come up on my feed, and to some extent or another, it's always um, Jerry Cantrell's main lyrics. And what I don't understand is, if you're going to bring back Allison Change, resurface, a resurgence, with a new singer, which is fine, he's good, he's talented. Why not use him? I've seen two or three vid- three videos now of new stuff, and I don't know if you want to say that the last three albums, or it's just the last one. It's fucking Jerry, and Jerry Cantrell sounds great. He's a great harmonizer. Some of this uh, music from Alice in Chains is dependent on him, and I love it. But he's not the lead singer. Sorry. He's just not that material. You can't, it just doesn't happen, and all the music sounds the same. When you listen to the harmonizations with Jerry Cantrell, they're amazing. When you hear the 90 to 96 uh, uh, highlighted Jerry Cantrell stuff, it's, 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 it's fabulous. And it's rooted in certain things that are in context, like they do their e- EPs and their acoustics or MTV Live, and even some of the songs like Wood. You know, you wouldn't have the sound, the uniqueness, if Jerry Cantrell, the guitarist slash vocalist, wasn't there. So I give him credit. But these new songs, uh, highlight the fucking singer, please. Can I have a fucking song where at least he sings the main part? It's ridiculous. I left a a Facebook message, uh, like a comment that was surprised. I'm like, how many videos is this now? Seven that I've watched? And, you know, combining live and stuff. In any case... Alice in Chains, the original lineup, minus in 93, they replaced the drummer. But Lane Staley, Jerry Cantrell, I mean, the drumming, this is a band that just worked well together. They all were spot on. You find beauty in every instrument, in every performance. So if you were really into drums, you know, you'll, you'll notice it. It won't be faded. It won't be, you know... Uh, just part of the everyday thing where you don't notice it. And if you like the bass lines where you're set there too, there's amazing bass grooves in almost every song. It's an experience that um, I cherish now, being able to um, go and look at any Alice in Chains song to 
do a deep dive and getting ready for a podcast and not worrying about how the song is going to affect me and doing my breathing exercises and my meditation, working through these things. I owe a lot to um, musicians and these are things that enrich my life. They will always be a part of me. There's a weird thing in psychology where, you know, people, I don't know, we have like a number where we can know or we attach ourselves to, whatever that number is, 150, whatever. And we can supplement real, well, I say real people, but that's how come movie stars can get in and you feel like you've lost a friend or a family member. Like we can form attachments with people we've never met. And it's what they bring forth. These experiences, these performances by Allison Chains with Lane Staley are breathtaking and sad. Watch some of these things. I posted on Facebook. I don't know if everybody's going to run to my Facebook page. But I posted some stuff. And you see uh, the most famous ones. I take it live at the Moore Theater, if anybody's interested. And you find some here and there. Now, I got a better technique. I find them easier. But still, raw, energetic, passion, amazing performances. Then you get to the MTV Unplugged days. There's no energy. There's no movement. It's still mesmerizing the performances because he was still using his talent his voice what he had to the best he could but he was i think the reports was he was he's six one was six one and when they found him he was like 86 pounds and you know go look at some of those things you watch live reaction videos and you'll see people literally crying there's a song he'll do an mtv thing he was based on most of the um, acoustic stuff they did and you can almost see in his writing you can see his future in it um, knowing what he was doing to himself admitting it isolating himself keeping away from people on purpose so they wouldn't see his end and you lose such a brilliant talented person it's just part of life I guess this is why we have such a issue with mental health. I mean, you don't, you don't even have to put this guy in a, a war situation. I mean, think about it again. This is not a war veteran who's been in three wars, been in and out, came back, formed a band, and couldn't get over his struggles. This is someone who, you know, was in a band. Yeah, and we all have our basis of life and you know, growing up but he had everything money fame looks um you know everything else you can imagine add that on and yet still the path of destruction was the one he went down it's just fascinating but i'm always gonna love alice in chains and i haven't discussed uh, like i said the newest stuff i'm not really familiar with it and i'll give them all the credit they can get Jerry Cantrell, the new singer, uh, just like I do with Queens, right? Keep going out, do your tours. I'm sorry I'm not going to probably be there in that sense because the music means so much to me. I would rather listen to the older versions and some of the live stuff. And this is a band that fits that thing for me. Now, I don't know if I would not take the opportunity to see them. You know, well, you know what? I probably wouldn't go. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> All right, so I've just rambled on a little bit here. Uh, it's just such an amazing band, talented on so many fronts, and a band my father, who's the b biggest Rolling Stones fan, real picky music guy. It was one of the only bands of my, the new bands I liked that he got into. So looking at Metallica, you know, Corn or Corn maybe, um, you know, just bands, and it was Alice in Chains that he was interested. Not my dad, my father, give a shit what my father fucking thinks, but if you knew my father, you'd know the type of person he was, and you know, that meant that, you know, in some way, maybe Alice in Chains was an amazing band. It's not just a, you know, a freak of luck. And this talent and raw emotion that he puts into these performances is just captivating. I recommend um, Love, Hate, Love. I don't know if that's the more theater version, but it's breathtaking. It's guttural 
pain. It's a song he says about pain. Oh, it's just beautiful. I recommend listening to Alice in Chains. Even the new stuff. I'll give it a shot. But the older stuff, the grunge, it was set by Facelift, that first album they put out. And in my opinion, they are the best of that crop. Although I give props more to um, Soundgarden's uh, longevity, maybe. But when you look at uh, Alice in Chains, the grunge metal sound, being able to do acoustic, uplifting, ethereal-like magical stuff that I compare to like Queensryche, where you have all the right pieces, the right writers and musicians, and it just comes together and works. And it works for Alice in Chains. Give them a shot. Listen to them. I really hope you enjoy it. Hope you enjoy this. And this is not, uh, I apologize, not a history and a, a great um, recap of who Alice in Chains is. It's more of who I am and what I love, uh, what it meant to me, and a little bit of, you know, props given to just the passion that they performed numerous times on stage and how you can use your voice, your talent to such an extent and have uh, such a tragic, destructive ending. It's a lesson to be learned. I like to see things change about mental health, but I implore everybody, go get help if you need it. I'm here if you want to talk, send me a message, you, anything. These are things we should not uh, have stigmas for. I describe it as going to the gym. You're going to go get pumped and your friends are standing there, pump, yay, you know, spotting you. And you came back from the gym. Everything's cool. I want the same type of feeling for people with mental health problems. Oh, you're going to the therapist, you know, yeah, can I help you? And I want to talk about that, whatever. So there you go. My ranting, rambling is over. Alice in Chains, one of my favorite bands ever. One of the greatest live bands, in my opinion. Give them a shot. I wish you all the best, and I'll see you all next time. Take care.